Good morning, Roseville Covenant Church. I am happy to welcome you to church this morning. I'm glad you're all tuning in and that you're here and that we can all worship together. Um, I would love to announce to you that Josh and Claire Freed just had their baby boy on May 31st. Cute little boy named Sloan Joshua. So if you guys uh, are on Facebook with them or have a way to contact him, wish him congratulations. Super cute little boy. So happy for those guys that's their first one. Um, also, um, it looks like Paul Hartmark is coming up next with um, some announcements from the lead team. Good morning, church. This morning, we'd like to remind you of the upcoming congregational meeting at one o'clock. It is for the purpose of approving a, our budget for the upcoming 2020 and 2021 uh, year, budget year. And so just a reminder that you're welcome to join us. Uh, the vote to approve the budget is uh, limited to those that are members of the church. However, anybody is welcome to attend, uh, again, via our electronic means. Uh, the notice went out earlier this week. So we hope you join us at one o'clock. This morning, we'd just like to pray to, to open up a time of prayer. Won't you pray with me? Lord, oh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We just praise you this morning for who you are, for what you have done in our lives, and the things that you have in store for us to do. Lord, we just ask all of these things as we um, uh, proceed into worship, that uh, you would be present with us wherever we may be. And we are looking forward to what good things you have in store for our church body. Amen. We call on the Lord in our distress, and he answers us. He comforts us in times of illness, peaceful protests about injustice, and lawlessness at night. So we give thanks with the psalmist. I lift my eyes to the hills where my help comes. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I am comforted in knowing that he watches over me, for he neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord watches over us. He is our ever-present, ever-shadowing shade, keeping us from all harm over our coming and going, today, tomorrow, and forever. Heavenly Father, we praise you, for you are holy, sovereign, and loving. We come to you today in sadness and lament, anger and hope, hope specifically in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, please forgive us for believing that our knowledge, experiences, and understandings were complete. They were not. And forgive us also that our actions on behalf of our brothers and sisters of color have been wholly inadequate. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to listen more, to feel more, to hold more, and to engage more, so that along with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we may glorify you as a whole, unified, compassionate reflection of the body of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you have proved to us over and over again so many times you have proved that you are faithful and trustworthy. You've proved to us that you're kind and loving, that you answer our prayers, that you love to say yes to the things we ask. Sometimes even before we ask, you surprise us and say yes to the things that we want to ask. And Lord, we know that you are good. But sometimes we feel so tired and weary and anxious as we look at our situation, as we look all around us. So we pray once again, Lord, we pray that you would protect us from all danger and harm. We pray this for our families, for our children and grandchildren, for our friends, for our brothers and sisters in this church, for our community, for St. Paul, for Minneapolis, for Minnesota, for our nation, for our world. Lord, you have said all power in heaven and earth 
is given to you. And you have told us that you love us with an everlasting love. And we know that you don't lie. So we ask that you would send healing and peace. And we ask that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, beginning with us. And make us a transmitter of your love to everyone whose life we come into contact with. In the name of Jesus, amen. God, I call out the sin of pride in myself. Sometimes I don't do and say what I know I'm supposed to do and say because I don't want to do it imperfectly or sound ignorant or unaware. And that's my pride. And I ask that you would walk with me in breaking down that pride and that you would teach me to take a humble posture, teach me to put the needs of others first, teach me to speak out against injustice, Give me the courage to do what's right. Let me put your will ahead of my own. Dear Lord, I recognize that you have been incredibly generous with your blessings towards me. And I recognize that I have not accepted the responsibilities that go with those blessings the way I should. I pray that you will work through me to heal this world, to spread your message, that you will use me as your hands and your feet. You have given me so much, and I can use those things for you, but I've not been willing to make the sacrifices needed. I pray that you will overcome my weaknesses, my foolishness, my selfishness, my insecurities. I can see by looking around me how much the world needs you and how little I do to meet that need. I pray that you will push aside my flaws and my weaknesses and that I will allow you to use me in whatever way you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. I recorded music for this service a few weeks ago. I'm thankful we were able to push pause on the Colossians series and take time Where for our did church. Say Colossians? Colossians is a book in the Bible. And we, t we pushed pause on it so our church could come together and mourn, reflect, and seek ways to move forward together these past few weeks. I'm also thankful for God's word as we continue to center our mind and body and spirit on together for worship. Um, and I wanted to remind you of the focus from last week from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. It says, So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. So this week, as we continue in Colossians and learn more about ways we can clothe ourselves in love within community, uh, we do that thanks to the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we don't have to do this work on our own. In John 14, 15 through 17, Jesus says, what did you say, John? That's another book in the Bible, and it's a name of a person that liked Jesus a lot. Which person? Well, John was his name. Jesus says, If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father, and he'll provide you another friend, so you will always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him doesn't know what to look for, but you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. As we sing this first song called Spirit Move, let's remember the way the Spirit has already moved in our lives and in our church and in our city, and we'll continue to do so as we pursue Christ well, over all.
another of Paul's letters, 1 Corinthians, he writes about spiritual gifts, uh, the body of Christ comprised of many parts and held together by love. <clears throat> a lot of us know chapter 13, love is patient, love is kind. Um, and this comes right before that. In chapter 12, verses 12 through 13, Paul writes, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by the Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. In my notes, um, handwritten in there, I wrote even intestines, so I'm sure at some point I heard a sermon about um, the parts that we can't see and underappreciate, um, and they are part of it too. Uh, but today, our pastors are going to be speaking about Colossians, um, starting in chapter 3, verse 18, going all the way through 4, and verse 1. And in that are roles and relationships in Christ. As we prepare to learn from that text, I pray the words of these next songs remind us that we can look to God for our next steps for our discernment as individuals within and part of the body and community of Christ. <clears throat>
remind us that you are our everything. That you are the center as we learn more from your word today and as we go about our lives in the week to come. Amen. Thanks for joining us in this time of worship through music this morning. Good morning. We today are going to be going through Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 1. Um, my name is Jackie, by the way. Um, and we will be doing it, uh, going through a discussion, a panel discussion of this passage. So we thought we'd do something a little different today. So first I will read it off my phone. So that's why I'm looking up to the side. It says Colossians 3, 1 through chapter 4, 1. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. And our first discussion question is this. As we initially read this passage, we can recognize its instruction has come under much criticism in the church's history. Why is this, or what questions does this raise for you? Yeah, I think um, even as we read that passage, it kind of raises um, certain feelings in me and those um, those feelings are a result of a history that I have with the passage and more broadly that I think the church has with this passage, um, ways that it has been taught maybe that have been unhelpful. Um, and while the passage is true, right, it's a part of our scripture, I think because Paul is changing here to a more kind of directive style of teaching and he's saying to certain groups of people do these things um it brings up some of the understanding that we have around religion being a set of rules um and so i think because it evokes that and because it um has some um loaded language around uh, uh gender I think that we're dealing with a passage of scripture that carries a lot of emotion for people. And historically, that has been true. I mean, we think of um, the Jewish people, the way that they would open up their prayers in the morning was with a word of thankfulness that God did not make them a woman or a slave. That was something that was prayed every morning. And so the fact that that is kind of rooted in their history and was a part of the understanding of what Paul was speaking into at this time um, is just kind of an understanding that maybe broadens our view of how we interpret this passage of scripture. Yeah, I would add, um, I would add to that as a, as a person who was single for a lot of their, well, all of their 20s and a lot of their 30s, I remember a lot of times where in the church, this passage and other passages like that were um, used to basically tell me to like tone it down. Um, that like as a woman and as a leader who is a woman, that if I didn't learn to submit, that I would never find like a husband. Um, and that's really harmful like language to instill into our young women and girls that um, submission is the reason they're not going to find someone or their leadership or the um, the way that God created them to be strong and independent. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of baggage that comes alongside of these verses for women especially that um, of what marriage looks like and what submitting looks like in a relationship. I think there's a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and I would uh, echo some of those thoughts. Um, certainly the, the church has been dominated from a, a male perspective uh, throughout the centuries, and uh, we need to come back to what scripture really says. And if we look at this companion passage that is uh, written by Paul in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 5.21, um, the whole uh, section begins with these words, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And as we submit to one another, that doesn't mean just men submitting to men or women submitting to women or women submitting to men. Um, this means we submit to one another. And the fact that uh, God created us, male and female, he created us to be um, active in this uh, role of ministry and, and sharing the good news of Christ. And the good news of Christ really opens up uh, the whole opportunity for us to be one in Christ. And, you know, through the ages, there's been a lot of uh, uh, discussion and coming from the, the male dominant position. Um, but again, um, Christ came to break down those barriers. The Apostle Paul writes very clearly about that. And we're in this together. And so we, we honor each other. We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I, I think that really speaks to this particular question and gives us an opportunity to be who God created us to be, whether that's male or female, we're all ambassadors of Jesus Christ. The second question <clears throat> says, Paul was writing this letter to a particular cultural context. How does that cultural impact, how, how does that culture impact how we understand this instruction? Well, again, I, I would say the, the cultural context was uh, written from um, the Jewish tradition, which we pick out of the Old Testament, and, and we find again that the the male dominance was there. And I think as Jesus came, he did a tremendous work at uh, inviting and encouraging women to be a part of uh, the ministry. Um, we look at the passage of scripture from uh, John chapter uh, four, where Jesus met with the Samaritan woman, um, totally out of context for Jesus to be speaking to a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. And um, as Jesus did that and ministered to her, um, she had the opportunity then to take that back to her community. And if you read farther in that chapter of scripture, you'll find that uh, many came to uh, faith in Christ because of this interaction with this woman. I think we also need to be reminded that um, uh, when the first ones to come to the tomb on that first Easter morning were women. And, um, you know, the scriptures could have uh, arranged that for men to be the first one to come to the tomb, but the women were the first to uh, recognize the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's important to remember that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, Context is like one of my favorite things to look into because I just find so much of the early church context really fascinating. Um, and in the in the church of Colossae, where Paul's writing this letter to, um, the makeup of their church was pretty distinctly um, like some people from Jewish culture and some people from Roman culture, and the difference between what marriages looked like between those two cultures. Um, really speaks into what Paul's trying to get at in these verses. Um, because as we've talked about what Jewish culture looked like um, was pretty male, male dominant. And um, in the Roman culture, marriage just looked different. Women had a little bit more agency and freedom to express um, publicly their thoughts and feelings and worship and prayer. And so in that early church, you have these two dynamics of what a marriage is supposed to look like from their culture. And Paul is trying to like bridge that gap and say like, you're both not like totally right. And in Christ, we have something that's new 
Um, and, and some of those pieces that Neil was just pointing out of, of we have a new vision of what men and women should be working together with um, from Christ. And so Paul is trying to say, like, you're in Christ now. So like, we need to bring those things into, um, into focus between these two dynamics that were really present in that church. Um, so I just think that that's like fascinating to think about um, at the core of what this passage is trying to say, um, Paul is, is saying your household should look different than the households around you because you know Christ. And so what's, what's the difference in your household because of your relationship with Christ than the Roman households around you or the Jewish households around you? What, what's the thing that makes your marriage different, your relationship with your kids different? your relationship with your um, slaves or servants different? What What's different about who you are? Yeah, I, I just uh, want to echo that and what both of you have just said. And I, I think it challenges us to, to think about not just like the quality of our relationships, but Paul was getting at just the understanding of hierarchy that we have in society. And he was kind of speaking into that structure and saying, you know, what are the ways that we think of ourselves as better than others. And scripture clearly um, states that that is not the attitude of a Christ follower, um, that we're supposed to serve one another in love, and that should be our status. And so he was speaking to societies that were used to a structure and a hierarchy, um, not only in their culture, but also in their home. And so Paul was pushing against that and saying, you know, there's a quality to what Christ brings into your home. That means it's not about a top down mentality, but it's about serving one another, submitting to each other, loving each other, and really these qualities that would be new um, to its listeners. So I think um, that was another important part of Paul's teaching here that um, I want to make sure that doesn't get lost because Paul was really um, echoing so much of what Jesus taught and lived out, um, a life of, of service and really humbling himself, and that that quality would impact our um, homes, that that was not separate from the rest of our lives, but um, our, a life of discipleship and following Jesus encompasses all of who we are. Um, I think the other thing that's really important here is that um, Paul names these different groups of people. He calls on husbands, he calls on wives, he calls on children and slaves. And I think that a lot of times, you know, specifically with women and children and slaves, they weren't used to being seen. So the fact that Paul notices them and um, rights towards them means that they are people, that they have a role and responsibility in the structure of society, and um, they have a unique um, calling. And so I think that that's another important piece um, as we look at this text. Sure. You guys kind of address this in, your, in what you're saying, but in what ways is this passage revolutionary for its day? Um, jump the gun on that one a little bit I think yeah yeah we did I, I do want to add another piece of it though even as you were talking Colleen about the the hierarchy and one of the ways that this text was meant to be revolutionary in its day um, one of the commentaries I read was about slavery in the first century church um, and they were talking about how um, Paul and the Christian movement in the early, early church knew that they weren't big enough to like abolish slavery in like the Roman structure and within the hierarchy of the time. And so their way to kind of create that movement was to talk about what relationships between masters and slaves were supposed to be like. And so when um, Paul is giving these instructions to masters, his like hope is that if masters are told to treat their slaves as if they are a member of the family, as if they are um, equal in Christ's eyes, then the hope was that slavery couldn't continue to exist because you can't like own another human being 
and still like see them through the eyes of Christ. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't line up. And so the revolutionary purpose of the day in that dynamic was to get at breaking down the societal system of racism through the love of Christ um, and through the way that we're meant to see one another. Um, and I think that that's revolutionary for first century church. And then you look at what we've done over the years um, in, in regards to slavery within America and how that was um, how the church used some of these scriptures to kind of do the opposite of that and to kind of continue to create this divide between slaves and masters um, and some of the the damage that we've done to uh, the culture of um, America because of that. Like, I just think that that's so interesting to like look back over the years to see how this text was meant to be and then how we've actually like used it in the church. Um, it's just, I feel, I feel like it's fascinating to look at. Yeah, I feel like that's a good response to people who question why Paul didn't just abolish slavery altogether. And I think remembering that Paul was working within a certain society and norms and um, an understanding of how things were supposed to operate, and not that that wasn't an important part of what he was dealing with, but I think first and foremost, the bigger transformation, the bigger change, was to understand who we are in Christ, and it was an identity statement. Um, I read one commentator and he wrote, the social revolution of the gospel is that we are all one in Christ, for Christ is all and is in all. And I think for me, that was a good reminder that the change that needs to happen as we um, wrap our identity around the identity in Christ is um, a really big, transformation. <laughs> I don't think we recognize all of the ripple effects of what an identity in Christ really holds. Um, and so that was what Paul was dealing with first and really trying to center this newfound community of faith around a group of people that were like Pastor Alicia said, were from different backgrounds and they were trying to grapple with, you know, what does this um, life of faith really look like? Um, when we come from different backgrounds. And I think first and foremost, Paul was saying, you know, it's about being in Christ and allowing your identity to be rooted in that. Yes, and I, I would add the, the scripture from uh, the first verse of chapter four, where it says, masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that brings a, a whole new dimension to the concept of masters and slaves recognizing that um, slaves now have worth and value. And we come back to the, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And as we think of um, you know, this context as to where this was written and the word that is for us to recognize that you know, the women, the children, the slaves, we're all in this together. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. And as the family of God, we treat each other differently. Hopefully in a godly way. That goes nicely into the fourth question, which is how might these instructions to our household relationships and our coworkers shape our thinking about these relationships today? And in light of our current pandemic, how are these words particularly appropriate? Well, I think one of the things that uh, we can look to is the fact that as families, we are in, a, in essence being forced to spend more time with each other. And as we spend more time with each other, you know, sometimes the, the living stones that we are have some rough edges and, and we grate against each other. And it gives us an opportunity to live in family and to recognize that there are times that we have to say, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And sometimes those words are, are more important and more si significant than always thinking that you have to be right. And because I'm the pastor, everybody has to agree with what I say. Um, but it causes us to be together as family. 
And as family, that's where the rubber really meets the road. And, um, you know, these have been trying times for, for some families. Um, you know, Nancy and I have an awesome relationship and, and we get along great. But uh, there have been a couple of times where we haven't understood where the other person is coming from. And it's out of humility that uh, we realize we need to come back and say what's most important. And what's most important is our relationship with Christ and our relationship with each other. And I think this passage really uh, emphasizes that. And during this pandemic, it strengthens that bond we have as family. Yeah, I think definitely uh, to echo a lot of that, like the pandemic creates these situations where we are now living and working and uh, doing everything in the same space as our loved ones. Um, and in all of my, you know, seven months of marriage, um, knowing that like early on in this conversation, we, or in this pandemic, Jed and I had to have some real conversations on like, what does working in the same space look like? What does living in this same space all the time look like? And had to have a conversation on what our needs were professionally and personally, and then how do we work together to, to meet both of those needs? And especially when one of us is an extrovert and the other one is an introvert, um, and one of us can continue to be with like, another person all the time and love it and then the other one is like I just need you to not be in my space for like an hour um that I have to be okay with that and I have to like learn how to um to work around some of those things uh and that both of our jobs are important enough to um leave some space for one another and whether that's a job or a hobby or an interest or um whatever your priorities are to be able to have those conversations of like we both have priorities. We can't pretend like we don't have separate ideas of what our time and space should look like. Um, and how do we combine those things in a way that's like mutually um, honoring is a big part of it. And how do we make sacrifices for one another to, to live out the, the every day. And those are super like practical ways to think about it, but it goes all the way through like how you make big life decisions of what's, what's priority and what's, what's our our hope for the future yeah i think as i think about this passage i you know we recognize that paul needed to give instruction in this cultural context because the people needed it right they needed instruction on how their relationships were to play out and what it meant to have christ impact their family relationships and you know, speaking from my own life, I find that I still need instruction. <laughs> like I still, I need help and I need guidance. And, um, you know, and pa pandemic just magnifies all of this because, um, you know, we are doing so much more centered around our home. Um, I, I talk to people um, specifically this past week more and more who are saying that um, it's been such a gift to be able to be at home. And I think sometimes in the busyness of our lives, we lose sight of how important these family relationships are to us. Um, and we can see each other more um, and more in the daily um, in this season. And so while it's hard and while, you know, I like um, Pastor Neil, how you put that about living stones and we all have rough edges. Um, I, I mean, that is that is all true. I think that um, our families, um, whatever shape they're in, are a gift from God. And um, I think in the busyness that, I, that encompass a lot of our lives, um, we are realizing the gift that we have and um, wanting to reorganize our lives, whatever, you know, post-pandemic looks like, um, just recognizing um, that gift for each and every one of us. But, um, you know, also I think that... Um, uh, it's a good time to check in with each other on how this is going. I mean, how often do we ask in our family relationships, how are we really doing in these areas? <laughs> you know, if, if we're really taking scripture seriously and saying, you know, Paul, 
was calling to the people in this day to some radical things. He was saying, you know, husbands, love your wives. Love was not what people married for in this society. They didn't marry for love. They married to procreate. They married to, you know, build this family unit. Um, but to love your wife um, was a different posture. Um, wives submitting to husbands out of, you know, in a way that is fitting to the Lord. This was above and beyond. And so how often do we look at the quality of our family relationships and say, how are we doing in these areas? Um, and helping each other move towards Christ-likeness in our family relationships. So it's a good time to kind of ask ourselves some of those questions, not in a way that uh, puts all of the ownership and the, the, um, the need for growth on other people, but is really an invitation to each of us to, to kind of model some of that in our, in our family life. Um, there's one more question that we should probably answer pretty quick. Uh, and it's, in what ways does remembering our identity in Christ help us live into these relationships? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, I think, like when you remember where your identity lies, it allows you um, to live and to love more fully. Like you understand that your identity in Christ means that you are accepted and forgiven and loved and, and complete in that relationship. Um, the thing that completes you is your relationship with God and your relationship in Christ, not any other relationship. And that kind of frees, personally, it frees me up to love other people, other people better because I'm not looking for completion in those relationships. Um, and one of the things that I think Pastor Colleen was just saying about checking in with the people around us. Like the first thing that you need before you can check in with other people is to be like right in your relationship with Christ because it makes you available more to understand where someone else is coming from and to hear them without hearing a negative thing about yourself. One of the things I was listening to a podcast recently about um, how to apologize. And one of the questions was like, why are we so bad at apologizing? And it's because when we were children, apologies always came with a lesson. Like if I apologized to my parents, it was always like, well, because you did this thing wrong and you should always like do it better. Apologies were never allowed to just be like, I'm just sorry that this happened. And then we accept the apology and, and move forward. Um, but the idea that like, when we really check in with the people around us, our identity in Christ and that completion that it brings allows yeah. us to live more fully into the rest of these relationships. I'm letting that sink in a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I said a lot of words really fast. Typical Alicia. <laughs> no, I, I think that's great. And I feel like um, in my own life, um, in my rhythm is to spend some time with the Lord in the morning um, as I get started in my day. And um, I just find that when I, uh, ground myself there, then the rest of my day feels like I'm coming from a more centered place. Um, and not that like I always make the best choices or um, have the right priorities, but I think that it means that I work first at connecting with God. And I see the way that that impacts my relationships. And it's not like, well, if I spend time with God, the rest of my day goes okay. That's not how it works. But I feel like as I prioritize that in my day, um, I change and my posture towards my day changes in a way that becomes really healthy for my relationships. And so it's no um, surprise that this passage about our, um, our relationships in our home is kind of bookended by some passages on worship and what it means to... Uh, fuel our relationship with God. And um, again, like I know we've already said it, but when we prioritize that and we can remember that ultimately um, who we are is in Christ, we are surrounded by the personhood of Christ and that he is supplying our lives with um, the good things that we need to do the work ahead of us. I think that when we recognize that he's providing that for us, um, it really does impact our relationships in a personal way. 
Um, so I just, I see that in my own life. I see fruit of that in my own life. And so um, as we think about our family relationships, um, our relationship with God becomes a priority. Yes, and I certainly agree with both uh, Pastor Alicia, Pastor Colleen. Um, our identity in Christ is, is where it's really at. And, you know, there, there's no um, doubt that the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We love one another because God first loved us. And so our identity comes out of that. And my thoughts go just briefly to um, 1 Corinthians 13, which is the, the love chapter. And in place of love, let me use the word or the words Christ in me. Um, just a couple of phrases. Christ in me is patience. Christ in me is kind. Christ in me does not envy. Christ in me does not boast. He's not proud, not rude. Christ in me always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Christ in me never fails. I know that I fail way too often. But when I come back to my identity, my identity is Christ in me, and he makes the difference. And I can forgive myself, I can forgive others, because I know that God first loved me. Well, this has been an awesome opportunity for us to have this discussion. Thank you, Jackie, for uh, directing us and leading us. Thank you, uh, Pastor Colleen, for your insight and your input. Pastor Alicia, um, thank you for your part in this uh, time as well. I would just like to close our time with prayer, and then uh, Pastor Alicia will come back with uh, just a brief announcement. But let's pray. Our gracious God, we are so grateful for your word. Your word is living and active. Um, it always prompts us and challenges us. And even this passage today, as we look at relationships in the family, we think of husbands and wives. We think of parents and children. We think of masters and slaves. Lord, in, in all of these relationships, more than anything else, you desire that we do what is right and fair and just. And so even as we come to this passage this morning, Lord, thank you that you are continuing to work in each of our hearts, in each of our lives, that you continue to challenge us to be more like you in our relationships. Lord, thank you for that love which reaches from one generation to the next, a love that reaches husbands and wives, a love relationship that is there and available as we look to each other as children of God, created in the image of God. Lord, thank you that you are watching over us, and thank you that you are sending us into this world to be ambassadors for you. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we have a special video to close out our worship service this morning. Um, as we continue to meet online, we want to keep asking the question of how to creatively bring the voices of our congregation um, to, uh, to our Sunday morning services. And so last week you heard um, Gabe Hartmark's arrangement and uh, performance of a hymn during communion. Um, and this week we have a worship video that was put together by Eric Anderson with some members of our worship team. And so um, the next song will be, uh, it's by Common Hymnal. It's called Who You Say You Are. And so we hope that you enjoy this um, as our our last piece of worship together this morning, and we hope we see you all in our congregational meeting at one. Thanks.
Run! 